Thank you, ladies. Going to have to give me just a minute to get my nest made. I may be Robert Taylor's daughter, but I did not inherit his memory. I have to have my little notes up here. So it's an honor to be here today. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. Um, my family has had a long relationship with this lectureship, the Memphis School of Preaching, and this congregation, and we're very thankful for that. What a great week we're, we're already starting to have. Timeless truth. We're in for a spiritual feast, and we're getting to have a reunion feast because there are people here that we don't get to see any other time of the year, but at lectureship we get the hugs and the catch-ups and, and the, the great Christian fellowship. Uh, my assignment this afternoon takes us to Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, and the role of the older women. Let's read the passage together. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, we live in a society and at a time when often instead of being valued for their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience, society tends to look at older people sometimes as a bother. They're discounted. People are ready to put them out to pasture, so to speak. It happens in businesses when employers sometimes choose to replace that older, experienced worker with someone younger who probably can be hired in at a lesser salary and the benefits won't cost as much. And the years of loyal service mean nothing. It happens in congregations when sometimes people decide we need to get rid of that old preacher and replace him with someone younger and more dynamic. Sometimes it happens in elderships when people want to replace those old elders with younger men. And sometimes I'm afraid that's because maybe there's a hope that the younger ones won't be quite as strict. Sadly, it even happens in families. Sometimes older family members are viewed more as a bother rather than the treasured blessings that they are. It can be hard to wrap our heads around the fact that by reason of those birthdays, we've now become the older women that Paul here addresses. I'm a level with y'all. I do not feel like the older woman. My friend Jeff Archie over in the International Gospel Hour booth asked me this morning, he said, why did they give you that topic? I'm like, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> when I think of the older woman, I still think of my mom and her generation. Um, I'm not in denial. I understand the birthdays mean I'm in that older woman bracket now. And we need to step up and we need to embrace that role. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, describes life principles in this passage, many of which apply to us regardless of age. Older women are to teach younger women. Guess what? Y'all are all older than people who are younger than you. We need to realize that. We have the same opportunity and obligation to be an example to those younger than we are, regardless of our age. Mothers of teenagers are probably looking to mothers of young adults to see how to navigate that empty nest and those years. Mothers of young children are looking to mothers of teenagers for how to navigate the teenage years. And teenage girls, younger girls are looking at you, for example. Our youth minister's little girl just turned six yesterday. And after church, she will come up to our teenagers, will you come play with me? Now, I remember when our teenagers were little kids wanting my children to go play with them. And bless those teenagers' hearts, they will stop whatever they're doing and go play hide-and-seek with London. All she's got to do is ask. But regardless of age, we need to be an example. 
we need to happily embrace the opportunity and the obligation to be the best example that we can and to teach those younger than we are. We need to realize there is no retirement in the Lord's Army. Now, age and health may mean that we need to have a job change, but we don't need to completely retire. God needs all his soldiers working, and there is work for all of us to do. My daddy's 90 years old. He's had to slow down a lot, but he plans to be here Thursday night to close out the lectureship as he has done for so many years. I have known of women, and I'm sure you have too, who when they reach that magic age, I'm done. I've done mine. Let these young ones do theirs. Now the women I know that have done that have only done it with church work. They haven't retired from their families. They haven't retired from their community activities, their social clubs, their civic clubs, their hobbies, their sports, whatever they fill the time with. But when it comes to volunteering at church, I'm done. Let these younger ones step up. And yes, younger ones do need to step up, and we older ladies need to let them. I have known of people who have such a tight grip on their preferred area of service that when someone younger does try to help, they're not allowed. That's not the way we should be either. One of my Jonathan's favorite people and favorite Bible class teachers was the lady that taught his first and second grade class at Grundy Street there in Tullahoma, Miss Lillian Smith. Miss Lillian's husband had died about a year before, just as we were moving to Tullahoma, actually. Now, my Jonathan's an adult, so this was years ago. But Miss Lillian was his Bible class teacher. Now, she was not one of those teachers that came in at the last minute and fumbled in the cabinet till she found the teacher's manual and read to the kids. She was prepared. She loved them, and they loved her. Miss Lillian was 75 and 76 years old when she taught that first and second grade class. And it met upstairs. She had to climb a flight of steps every week. And when age and health meant that she could no longer do that, she continued to do other things. She passed away just a few months shy of her 100th birthday. We were hoping she'd make 100. We were going to have a big old party. But I want to be a Miss Lillian. I don't want to be a I'm done. A little background on the book of Titus. Paul wrote this probably in about AD 67, would have been probably the last year or so of his life. Titus was Greek, he was a Gentile. We know that from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 3. He was a great help to Paul in his ministry. We read about that in 2 Corinthians 8, Galatians 2, and Titus 1. In Titus chapter 1 verse 4, Paul refers to him as mine own son after the common faith. There was a very close relationship there. Paul had left Titus on the island of Crete to set in order the things that were wanting and to ordain elders in every city, chapter 1, verse 5. Crete would be a difficult place for the church to flourish. Cretans had had a bad reputation for a long time. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, this witness is true. Titus chapter 1, verse 12, and the first part of verse 13. What a way to be known throughout time as liars, evil. So it would have been even more important for the Christians in Crete to live their Christian lives, to set a good example, to show the superiority of the Christian way of life, and a contrast with the pagan way that the people of Crete were living. Paul gives instructions for the kind of men who would be qualified to serve as elders. He gives instructions as to how the men and the women of the congregation were to behave. You know it should be only natural that younger men and younger women be able to look to older men and older women, for example, in teaching. 
we set an example every day by what we do and how we live. It's either a good example or it's a bad one. We set that example in private, in public, and online in our social media presence. And online is even more far-reaching and more long-lasting. It's more permanent, it's more public. Our example includes the way we act, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we dress. And it includes all those things on Facebook too. There's a lot of good that can be done on social media for the cause of Christ. Our brethren have put out tremendous content online, particularly in the last two years with COVID and the pandemic. There are mom groups, there are Bible class teacher groups, there are Bible study groups, there are preacher's wives groups. There's so much good that can be done through social media for the cause of Christ. Sadly, when Christians don't behave online as they should, much harm can be done as well. Our example isn't something we just put on and take off like a jacket. It is who and what we are. Can people see Jesus in us? Can people see Jesus on your Facebook? Or would they be surprised to know that you claim to be one of his? How about Instagram and Twitter? How about Snapchat and TikTok? Can they see Jesus there? The word here as example is literally, according to Strong's Concordance, an underwriting to trace letters for copying. Remember in elementary school when we were learning to make our letters? Above the, what was then a blackboard would be the whole alphabet, the way it was supposed to look. And you'd get a sheet of paper and there'd be the example on the top row the way the letter was supposed to look. And then there'd be a row maybe of dotted lines and you traced over those to get in, in the habit of how to make the letter. And then the third line, you're on your own. You had to make the letters yourself. And how well you did was based on how close the third line was to the first line. That's the example, copying under. Our lives as Christians should be such that someone can copy our example and be right. Not perfect, but right. In the opening verses of Titus 2, Paul gives instructions for the older men. In verse 3, he moves to the women, likewise, meaning in the same way. Paul lists several areas in which the older women need to be examples. Our behavior is to be that which becometh holiness. The word translated holiness is from the Greek word for sacred, denoting something suited to a sacred character, that which is befitting in persons, actions, or things consecrated to God. You know, if we get that part right, that holiness part right, Everything else will fall into place. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The New King James says in all manner of conduct. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Because we are behaving in a way that is becoming of holiness, we will not be false accusers. The idea of being a false accuser is also translated slanderer. According to Strong's Concordance, it is from the same word we use to describe Satan. That's serious. God views it seriously and so should we. We will not lie. Such is simply not compatible with holiness. It is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6.18. If we are striving to be like him, we will not be false accusers. 
the scripture goes on to state, we are not to be given to much wine. This is not to be taken as a license for social drinking. The Holy Spirit would not allow for moderation in drinking alcohol. Some people will say, well, the Bible just condemns being drunk. It doesn't condemn drinking, so a little bit's okay. Just realistically, when someone drinks that drink that puts them over the legal limit, is that one drink, that last drink, what made them drunk? Or is it the culmination of all of it? You know, the Holy Spirit also would not contradict himself from one place to the other. In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 to 32, he inspired the Proverbs writer to say this, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. That the older women of Crete in the church were to abstain from the use of alcohol would stand in stark contrast to the pagan people they lived around who likely were given to much wine. Paul instructs older women to be teachers of good things. Our lives and our example are going to teach something. We need to make sure that we're teaching right things, good things. What follows is a list of divinely inspired things that we need to be teaching. The training would involve learning how to live as a Christian woman by seeing the example of the older women and by their active teaching. And we're not told the background of the Cretan church, but I think it's at least possible that some of these women were converted from paganism. And there would be a huge lifestyle change between what they had been in the world and what they now needed to be in Christ. Very possibly, some of these women had not grown up serving the one true God, either in Judaism before or in Christianity now. They were babes in Christ and still learning. And we need to remember today that new Christians need time and love to grow in Christ, and we need to be patient with them. Just as babies must learn to crawl before they walk and then run, so too must babes in Christ. You know, someone who is my age that becomes a Christian looks like me. We're the same age physically, but spiritually, I should be way ahead of that person in my knowledge and my development because they're just a new Christian. And I've been a Christian for many years. Some of you who know me well know that Luke Davis has Grana right here in the palm of his hand. But you know, I'm not going to come in here and tell you how upset I am because Luke cannot do calculus. He just can't. I don't know what's going on with that kid. Luke is five. Calculus is not a pre-kindergarten subject. I should not expect him to be able to do calculus. Now, if you want to talk dinosaurs, he's your man. He's taught us some names that we didn't know existed. My husband misidentified a dinosaur when they were reading a book not too long ago, and Luke looked at him and said, Papa, you really need to learn your dinosaurs better. <laughs> that new grandbaby that we're getting in June, when her mommy and daddy bring her home from being born for the first time, none of us expect her to be able to jump out of her car seat and run into the house like her big brother does. It's beyond her capability. And we need to give new Christians time to grow. Now, we do need, have a right, and we need to expect spiritual development to occur. There does need to be evidence of growth. 
we do not do our young people any favors when we let them do that calculus in advanced placement, college level classes in high school, but when it comes to church, we're okay if they just show up most of the time on Sunday morning and stay for class. If they're Christians, they're not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. They need time and love and space to grow, but they do need to grow. Both their living example and the active teaching of the older women would be necessary for those younger women in Paul's day and in our day as well. And ladies, we cannot teach what we do not know. We have to be good students of the word ourselves. And we have to live the Christian life ourselves before we can successfully teach those who are younger. Paul told the older women to teach the younger women to be sober. This is the idea of prudence and sound judgment. They were to be serious about living the Christian life. Now we can be serious about our Christianity and still laugh and have a good time and enjoy life. Those are not mutually exclusive things. And I'm afraid sometimes some of us kind of act like they are. As Christians, should we not be the most joyful people on the face of the planet? We absolutely should be. A Christian understands when it's time to be lighthearted and when it's time to be serious and sober. Young women were to be taught to love their husbands and to love their children. They need to be taught the idea of commitment, commitment to the Lord and His church, commitment to their husbands and their families. You'd think that would come naturally, but when you think about the divorce rate for just any old reason, I'm tired. This is not as much fun as I thought it would be. I found somebody I like better. When you consider the divorce rate, when you consider the instances of both spousal and child abuse, Love that seems natural to us is not always present in the world. When we think about the millions of precious innocent babies who have been murdered by abortion just in our country, the maternal love that comes naturally to us is not always present in the world. The older women would show, both by example and by active teaching, how to love their husbands and love their children. The idea of love for your husband is that of affection as a wife. A Christian wife will want the very best for her husband in every aspect of life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, socially. She will do everything she can to help him go to heaven. She will be supportive of him. Society today often portrays husbands as useless, stupid, a bother. Think about the television shows. Now, I know we don't watch much network TV because of what's on network TV, but commercials. How many times do you see the wife portrayed as the brains of the outfit who's got to put up with her poor, stupid husband? Christian women should never be part of that. We should not belittle or make fun of our husbands, either in public or in private. And a husband shouldn't do that to us either. Older women would teach the younger women to love and respect their husbands. Boy, my mouth gets dry up here. A Christian mother will have maternal love for her children. She will, above all else, want her children to be faithful Christians. She will do everything in her power to pass that genuine faith on to her children, just as Lois and Eunice did to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.5. One of my favorite verses is 3 John 4. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. I can't believe I didn't put that in the book. I don't know where my head was. My children refer to that as one of the mom verses. 
because when they get a card or something in the mail from me, that verse is always going to be on the bottom of the card, along with a few others. And they call those the mom verses. Too many mothers today seem more interested in their children being popular and successful in the world rather than spiritual. What's emphasized in your home? Does God truly come first, as Matthew 6.33 tells us? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing at your house? Does God really come first, or does he get the leftovers after job and school and sports and hobby and fun and however else we spend our time? I'm afraid sometimes parents unintentionally, and I think it is unintentional, send a mixed signal to their children. When we let our kids put church behind everything else, when we let them skip for any and everything, after all, they've made a commitment to the team. What about the commitment they made to the Lord? Sometimes we send them a mixed signal. We tell them we want them to be faithful, but we don't make them live it every day. And usually it's not a 180 degree flip, but a series of small steps, small compromises. It's just this once. They're only young once. Well, let them be kids. And I'm afraid we send them a signal that maybe God doesn't come first. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is a classic for how God wants us to spend time with our children. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. There's a whole lot of time in those verses. Verse 20, And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? And the Israelite parents at that point were to tell the children what had happened in Egypt. We were Pharaoh's slaves. They were to tell all the wonders that God had done to deliver them from Egypt, how he had brought them to the promised land. Their children were going to ask why. And our children today are going to ask why. And we have to be able to give them a Bible why. The closing verses of this chapter explain the reason. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statues, statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day, and it shall be our righteousness. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Much of society today seems to go to one extreme or the other with children. They're either treated as a bother and we need to find somebody to keep them for us. Um, when the Senate recently passed the thing about extending, making daylight savings time permanent, one of the senators, and I don't remember which one it was, said something about, you need more daylight so the kids can go out and play so you're not bothered with them. So you're not bothered with them? The other extreme has children as the center of the universe, with everything revolving around them, and they're really the boss. Both extremes are harmful, and neither one is what God wants. 
the great contrast between how these Christian women were to live and the pagan society in which they lived is shown again in verse 5. They needed to learn to be discreet. The idea of self-control, that's very important to God. It's very important for the Christian. It's not the exact same Greek word, but it's still the same idea of self-control as you find in the fruit of the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's the word that would be translated self-control. Against such there is no law. This same idea is in Peter's personal growth scale that we call the Christian graces in 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7. And beside this, giving all diligence, there's that diligence again, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, self-control, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Self-control keeps some real good company in the scriptures, doesn't it? <clears throat> These young women were to be taught to be chaste. It's C-H-A-S-T-E, not C-H-A-S-E-D. <laughs> There's a big difference in those two words. The word chaste carries with it the idea of being pure, modest, the instruction that Paul gave in Timothy about being adorned modestly is to be that which becometh a woman professing godliness. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. Sadly, much of what is worn today has nothing to do with professing godliness. Sadly, quite the opposite. Maybe that would be a good question for us as we're shopping for clothes and as we're shopping with our daughters. Is this outfit becoming of someone professing godliness? And if it's not, the time to have that discussion with your daughter is at the store when you explain why you can't buy that for her. You've given up a whole lot of the battle when she pulls it out of her closet after you already caved in and bought it. Older women were to teach the younger women to be keepers at home, meaning workers at home. She's going to take good care of her family. That's going to be her main focus and her main concern. Back in about 18, the 1860s, 63, 65, somewhere in there, a man by the name of William Ross Wallace wrote a poem and the poem itself is largely forgotten, but there's a phrase out of the poem. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Think how different our world would be. Think how different the news right now would be if the cradles of some world leaders had been rocked by the hands of godly Christian mothers. Sometimes, Helping provide for our families may include working outside the home. We have examples of women in Scripture who conducted business to help take care of their families. The worthy woman of Proverbs 31, Lydia in Acts 16, Priscilla in Acts 18. Now, I'm not talking about somebody who has to do that because I want a mansion and a new expensive car and designer clothes. I'm talking about women who do this to help take care of their families. There are a lot of women over the years who have had to go to work in some capacity to provide health insurance because their husband was self-employed, a small business owner, a preacher, Maybe the salary wasn't enough to provide basic necessities for a, to support a family. There are faithful Christian women that have had to go to work for good reason. My mother went to work when we got a little older so that Tim and I could go to school at Fried Hardeman. I'm thankful she was willing to do that. My grandmother 
was left a widow with six children, and she was six months pregnant with the seventh child when my grandfather died very suddenly in 1936. The only way she could keep her family together was to go to work outside her home. And I hope nobody said anything to her like, those kids just lost their daddy. Don't you know they need their mama at home? <laughs> yes, yeah, she knew that. But the only reason she was able to keep them at home was to go to work. Older children had to help get jobs. Middle children had to help raise the younger children. Everybody stepped up, but she kept her kids together. <clears throat> but a Christian wife and mother will continue to have her Christianity, her family as her main focus. That's where her power is. Sometimes society kind of looks down on full-time wives and mothers. You know, you're just a mom. Just? You are raising the next generation of soldiers for the Lord's army. There's no just a mom about it. There is no more important job. The young women were to learn to be good. They were to be taught to be obedient to their own husbands, to be in subjection. Paul tells us to be in subjection to our husbands as unto the Lord. By inspiration, he gives a divine hierarchy. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. Now that really goes against current thinking in society, doesn't it? But society doesn't set our standard of behavior. God does. Now two things are needed for this to work the way it should. Wives are to be in subjection as unto the Lord, and husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, a sacrificial love. Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 25. You know, subjection isn't really tested if everything's going my way. If the decisions that my husband makes are the same ones I would make, I'm really not having to, to bend my will. There's no real subjection involved. Subjection kind of has to come into play when I think we should do this and he thinks we should do that. Now, I'm not talking about anything that would violate the Word of God. I think we should buy this because it's cheaper, and I think it'll work just fine. He thinks we should buy that because while it costs more, it's probably better made and it'll last longer. And that's frequently how the discussions at our house go, because <laughs> I'm the cheap one. <laughs> Have there been times over the years when he came back to me later and said, you know, you were right, I should have listened to you? Yes. Have there been times over the years when I needed to be the one to say, you were right, I was wrong, your way was better? Yes. I need to accept that when he makes a decision that's different than the decision I would make, it's because he's doing what he thinks is best for his family. Is subjection always easy? No, but it is biblical. You know, it's very possible that some of these women in Crete were married to men who were not Christians. Perhaps they were even still practicing pagans. And that would make marriage and subjection even more difficult. But by their example, perhaps they might be able to win their husbands for Christ. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5. Paul then gives us the why of all this that the word of God be not blasphemed. The word translated blasphemed means to vilify, to speak evil of, to use speech to bring down another's value, to injure another's reputation in the eyes of others. The pagan people of Crete were no doubt looking for any opportunity they could find to attack Christianity. And the hypocrisy of Christians not living as they should would give them that opportunity. And ladies today, the world is looking for any opportunity they can find to attack Christianity. And the hypocrisy of Christians not living as we should would give them that opportunity. 
The role of the older women in the church is a very important one, both by example and by teaching. Ideally, a young woman's main example and main teacher would be her Christian mother, but we all have a role to play. Think about those great Christian women that you've known in your life, that you looked up to, that were an example to you, that guided you in your Christian walk. We need to be that kind of example for others. Pay it forward, if you will. If you want to be a sweet, godly older woman, it's a lot easier if you start as a sweet, godly younger woman. Some of you all will know who I'm talking about. This lady was at Getwell many years ago, Sister Lottie Gaines. Sister Gaines was just the most gracious, southern, sweet lady you would ever meet. And some of us used to talk about how we needed to take Sister Gaines pills so that when we got to be her age, we could be as sweet as she was. And someone, and I think it might have been Corinne Elkins, said, it, you know, it would be easier if you started taking those now. <laughs> as Christian women, we need to live in such a way that all can see Christ in us. Our example should be one that can be followed. Paul told us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called, Ephesians 4 and 1. Christianity is to be our vocation, our way of life. Young women, we need you to be teachable, to be willing to live and learn as Christ would have you. By following the Spirit's instruction, a beautiful relationship between older and younger sisters in the family of God can develop and will last forever. It will be of great value to us. It will be of great value to the Lord's church. May God help us as we try to be the kind of example that we should be. Thank you for your attention and thank you for being here. And I will turn it back over to Melissa, who probably has some announcements.